Let's look at the word of the Lord this morning. If you want, if you're hungry for something from the Lord this morning, you're, I believe he wants to do it. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, let's look at the first six verses. Acts chapter 19. And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, why don't you just pay attention to that name, Apollos. Apollos was at Corinth. Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. Notice he says Ephesus. So just remember, Apollos and emphasis. Not emphasis, Ephesus. <laughs> there he found some disciples. Everybody say disciples. disciples. Amen. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, Jesus. On hearing this, they didn't wait. They didn't ponder it. They didn't put it off till next week. They didn't put it off till next month. On hearing this, they were baptized. I submit to you, they were baptized that day. In the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for the truth this morning. Thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Lord, for filling me with your spirit. I thank you, Lord, for allowing me to enter into a blood covenant with you, Lord Jesus, through baptism. I thank you, Lord, for all that you're desiring to do in these last days. And, Lord, we're excited about being able as your church, as your body, to be a part of this end-time revival that's going to be taking place. Lord, stir us. Lord, shake us. That we be used the way that you would have us to be used. In the name of Jesus, amen, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing with me. I'm speaking this morning on the topic. It's really a question. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Now, I know the majority of the folks here have got the Holy Spirit, and you know how wonderful of an experience it is. But I believe God wants to fill every single person here this morning with the Holy Spirit. The enemy would love for you to not be here. The enemy would love for you to not receive it if you've not received it. He, he wants you to just drag on and drag on, but I'll tell you what, it's a promise from God, and he wants to fill people. There's people that ought to be here this morning that are not here, and that's unfortunate. I'd love to see every single seat in this building filled because every single person in the entire world needs to hear that they can have the baptism of the Holy Spirit in their life. Amen. And can I say something, folks? We're starting to get some of our children at the age where they should be receiving the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I mean that with sincerity. I, I want to see some of these children being baptized with the Holy Spirit. If you can bring them here on a Friday evening for prayer, bring those children to prayer on Friday let God touch them. Let, let, let these children see you praying. Let these children see you seeking God. Let these children see you speaking in tongues. Let these children see you being affected by the power of God. You are the, only, you are the primary example that they have in their life to understand what you've got. I, I'm, I'm speaking as a pastor right now. These children need the Holy Spirit. Say, well, they're kind of young. I'm just telling you what I feel like the Lord put on my heart to say. I, 
I feel like these children, need, I want to I see these kids speaking in tongues. I want to see these kids filled with the Holy Ghost. I want to be putting some of these children in the water in the name of Jesus. Baptizing them. I know some, there's, there's some that are a little bit young, but there's other ones. That, they're getting to the age where I believe they get the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 And I believe you want to see your children filled with the Spirit of God. Amen. You know, I heard a story years ago, several years ago, and uh, this, this, uh, this, this fellow was driving down the road, and he saw a limousine on the side of the road. Maybe you've heard it. It's a story. I don't know if it's true or not, but it goes so well with my message this morning, I thought I'd share it. And I have to preface that because if I tell it as it's absolutely positively true and then you find out that it's not true, he preaches lies. So I'm just telling you, it may or not be true, but it sounds like it would be wonderful if it was true. You with me? So this fellow's driving down. You know, a lot of these stories, these sermon illustrations, they're not really true. It's something that somebody made up. But they, they really go good with your message. So this fellow's driving down the road, he's in his blue jeans, and he sees this limousine on the side of the road with a flat tire, and he sees the limo driver all dressed up in his nice suit, and he's doing his best, to, to, he, could, he could change the tire, but you know, he's all dressed up, he's all duded up, and, and he's out there, and he's got the jack, and he's trying to jack up the car, and, uh, and, and this fellow, he drives by, and he sees this, and he says, hey, you know, I'm young, I'm healthy, I'm, I'm in my blue jeans, and I... I do this for elite works on cars for a living. He thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and help this fellow out. So he gets out, pulls in behind the limo and, hey, hey can I give you a hand? And he says, yeah, I can give you a hand. Can I, can I give you a hand? Yes, please, give me a hand. So the fella gets out there and he starts, he changes, changing the tire and, and everything's going good and the limo driver's watching him and he's getting the tire changed and about that time the window rolls down in the back of the limo and there's the passenger of the limo. Happens to be a very wealthy businessman. And the businessman is the fellow's finishing up the tire. He's putting the car back down and off the jack. And the passenger in the limo says, thank you for helping out. What is your address? I would like to send you a token of my appreciation. And the you know, the fella, he just, he, he's just a normal, everyday guy like you and me. He, doesn't, he didn't pull over and help out expecting to receive anything. But So he, he said, no, that's, all, that's fine. No, 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 no. You don't owe me nothing. You don't have to do anything. And the, and the, the, the wealthy businessman says, oh, but I, I, I want to do something. What, can, I do, can I at least send your, your, are you married? And the fella said, yes, I'm married. He said, can I at least send your wife? a nice bouquet of flowers, and he says, oh, that would be wonderful. My, my wife loves flowers. And so the man gave him his address, and a couple days later, the ring on a the doorbell, there's a big, beautiful bouquet of flowers, and, and uh, he, his wife didn't, didn't understand. He said, what, what are these flowers? So his, her husband explained to her what had happened with the tire. Well, a couple weeks go by, and the fellow gets a call from the bank. Yeah, what's going on? We need you to come down to the bank. Well, what about? Well, you'll, we need to talk to you about something. And he's nervous. He's, he's kind of scared what's going on. What did I do? He tells his wife, hey, have we got, are we up to date on our bills? Have we been paying our mortgage? Have we been paying? What, 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 what could they be wanting to talk to us about? Well, they get to the bank. And the bank says, we, we just want you to know that some fella just paid off your mortgage. So every time I see a limo on the side of the road, I pull up behind it. Because you never know. And I think some of you might be thinking the same thing. Well, sometimes it does work that way, doesn't it? 
Uh, but you know what? The bottom line is, folks, none of us really turn down gifts. I, I've never seen anybody in my 64 years at Christmas time be handed a gift with their name on it and say, nah, yeah, it's okay. I've never seen anybody at their birthday and they get a birthday present and they say, no, thank you. I've never heard anybody when their boss at work says, I want to give you a raise. You're, you've been a great, a great employee and I want to give you a raise. I never, I never heard anybody say, no, thanks. I'm, I'm satisfied with the amount of money. Have you ever heard anybody say, no, I don't think so. <laughs> but here's the thing. People won't don't turn down their mortgage being paid off. People won't turn down Christmas presents. People won't turn down birthday presents. They won't turn down raises from their employer. But I see so many times you talk about the gifts of God and people say, yeah, not for me. When it's the best gifts, he owns the cattle and the fountain. He owns everything. He spoke the universe into existence. Why would anybody not want? Oh, but I feel that there's some folks here this morning. You want what God has for you. And can I tell you, you've come to the right place. You're not here by accident. You're here because God's got something for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, when it comes to the promises of the Lord, we surely don't want to miss any. Amen. Hallelujah. So in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, this is, I believe, an essential portion of Scripture with some important points that I would like to point out this morning. In verse 1 that we looked at, um, Acts chapter 19, verse 1, look at this. And it happened that while Apollos, I asked you to think about that name, Apollos. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. And that came to Ephesus is important. And there he found some disciples. That word disciples is important. Now this verse, Acts chapter 19 verse 1, mentions Apollos. And it also mentions that he, Paul came to Ephesus. Now if you look at Acts chapter 18, one chapter before Look at what it says in Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through 26. Now, a Jew named what? Apollos. This is the same Apollos from Acts chapter 19. A Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came, look, it came to Ephesus. The same as Acts chapter 19 says that they came, Paul came to Ephesus. Apollos was in Ephesus. So you're talking about that same region. And then it talks about Apollos. It says he was an eloquent man, competent in Scripture. That would have been competent in the Old Testament. The New Testament was being written at the time. Verse 25, he'd been instructed in the way of the Lord. That's Jesus. He'd been told about Jesus, he was instructed about Jesus, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. But look at what it says, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now verse 26 is an important verse. He says, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. This means that Apollos, he was eloquent. He was understood some things about Jesus. But there were also some things that he was missing Now Aquila and Priscilla hear him speaking and they're saying, Amen! Amen. Right. To some things, Amen! To other things. But then all of a sudden, Apollos starts talking about baptism. Yeah. Because he only knew the baptism of John, which was the baptism of repentance. Mm -hmm. And he's preaching about that and Aquila and Priscilla say, Mmm. 
Mm -mm. And so they privately, they, they don't embarrass him. They don't raise their hand and say, not preacher, you're preaching false. No, they understand this man loved God. He was preaching the truth that he had. So they take Apollos to the side. They say, Apollos, you're a good man. You're eloquent. You're, you're, you're knowledgeable of the scripture. You're, knowledge, you're knowledgeable about Jesus. But there's some things that you've got a little bit wrong. And so he hears it. And he receives it. Amen. What were the things that they told Apollos? They said, Apollos, you're right about Jesus, but you're wrong about baptism, Apollos. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we can see what Apollos was told by looking at Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, what we read. The believers that Paul found in Ephesus were like Apollos. They were from the same area. They, went, they were in Ephesus. They were teaching the same. They believed the same thing. They believed that baptism by repentance. So they were both in Ephesus. Apollos and, and these believers from Acts chapter 19 were both in Ephesus. They were believers in the Lord Jesus through John the Baptist preaching. It's possible that these believers in chapter 19 were companions of Apollos and had come with him from Alexandria. It's very possible that these believers in Acts chapter 19 were friends with Apollos, probably heard John the Baptist preaching, heard about Jesus. But they were... The Bible says in Acts chapter 19 that they were disciples. Now that word disciple is important. It means a learner, a pupil. Can I tell you this morning, it's important for us to have a teachable spirit. I don't care how much truth you have from God. You never have all truth. You never understand 100% about God. We're ever learning and we're coming to the knowledge of the truth which is a growing truth. We get closer to the Lord. We're learning more about him. It's very possible this morning that you may be here this morning and, or you're watching us live streaming on, 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 uh, on, on uh, YouTube and you've never heard before what I'm talking about. God wants you to understand what I'm talking about here this morning. So have an open mind. Have an open heart to receive. So both Apollos and these believers were teachable. They were disciples. And that's clear. They had some truth. You're here this morning. If you know anything at all about Jesus, you have some truth. They knew about Jesus. They believed. They were excited about what they heard, what they had, what they had received. They were excited about it. How do I know that? Because they were sharing what they had. You know, there's something about when you get truth. You love sharing it with somebody else. Why? Because truth will change you. Truth will set you free. Truth will bless you because it's truth from God. And it will, it will, it will do something to you. And you say, you know what? Everybody needs to hear what, what, what's happened to me. Everybody needs to hear this truth. So they knew about Jesus. They believed what they had been taught. They had believed what they'd heard. They had been baptized into John's baptism. And they were hungry to learn more about the Lord. They were hungry to learn everything and anything that they could about Jesus. They were open to receiving more truth. Yes. And this is where I have to be. You have to be hungry to receive more. And it's like those gifts that I say at Christmas time birthday time. We love to receive gifts, but can I tell you there's gifts, there's un untold gifts that God gives us in promises. Hallelujah. They were eager to learn more and to receive more. I want all that the Lord has for me, folks. And I want all that the Lord has for you. I want my antennas to be tuned in to what God's saying. How about you? Amen. 
Sometimes it means we have to change how we believe. When we hear something that's contrary to what we believe, we need to not just brush it off. We need to say, I need to study that. If it's contrary to truth, then God will show you that, and he will, that, will, that will actually help build a, a firm foundation under you because you know what truth is. Regardless of whether it's true or not, if you pray about it and you ask God to help you see truth, he'll point out the false things, and he'll also, you ought not be afraid to study the Word of God because it's a living book. It's a living book. It's the Word of God. Hallelujah. So sometimes it means we have to change what we believe because you know what? I had to do that. I was raised, I was not raised in this. I had, to, I had to look and see and say, you know what, that's contrary to how I was raised. But I feel there's something here, and, I, and you pray about it, and you read about it, and you study about it, and you find out what truth is, and God blesses you. Sometimes we don't see the whole truth. And I think there's always more truth. There's always more truth. And truth is exciting. I remember when I first got saved, I, I, I was 19 years old, I'd never had a Bible before. And I got to reading, and the Lord, it was just like, it was like watching a movie. When I was, and what I mean by that, it's like things were coming to life. How, how could that be? Because this is a living book. And as I'm reading through the scriptures, God is showing me things. He's showing me about What's that man's name? Uh, never mind. I'm having one of those 64-year-old moments. But it showed me things and revealing things to me, and I was getting excited. And somebody told me about the Holy Spirit, receiving the Holy Spirit, and I'm like, oh, everybody needs to hear about this. But I hadn't received it yet, so I'm going around... Sister Rabs, I'm going around, I'm telling people, hey, have you heard about the Holy Spirit? What's that? Right oh, you'll speak in tongues when you get the Holy Spirit. They say, have you got that? And I said, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> they say, you mean, you're, you're, what's this speaking in tongues? It's you speaking in another language that you've never learned before. They say, you mean to tell me that you're going to speak in some language you've never been taught before? Yeah. I said, that's right. It's in the Bible. You better stop talking like that. They're going to put you in a crazy house. <laughs> but I believed it. And two weeks after I was, I was baptized, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, spoke in tongues. So believing did not automatically give me the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts chapter 19, verse 2. Look at this, if you would, with me. He said to them, this is Paul asking these folks, these, these, verse 7 says there was about a dozen of them. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Now this is an important verse. Because some people teach that you already have the Holy Spirit if you believe. And you may be here this morning and you've heard that and people are trying to tell you, if you believe, you've already got the Holy Spirit. If you're watching us on live stream, there may be some that are watching us that say, I've heard that whenever you believe, you automatically have the Spirit. So it's important for us to understand this verse. Paul certainly did not believe that you receive the Spirit automatically when you believe. If he had... He would not have asked them if they had received the Holy Spirit when they believed. Amen. He would have said, have you believed? And they would have said yes. And he would have thought, well, you've got the Spirit. But he asked them plainly, and this is important. He said, have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? Yes. Now, he wouldn't have asked that question if they would have automatically received it when they believed. That question would have been redundant. It would have been unnecessary. It would, have, would not have even crossed his mind. Now, you may receive some revelation when you believe in God's leading you and guiding you. But just believing does not automatically mean that you have the Spirit. Amen. Now, let me dig a little bit deeper into this. They answered Paul, and they said this, No, we have not even heard 
that there is a Holy Spirit. Now that's an important response. When Paul heard their answer, he knew that they had not received the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to prove to you why. It's possible for a person to receive the Holy Spirit and not know what it is. There's this girl that I met down at the church where my my son goes. He attends in Athens, Georgia. And this girl was driving past their church. She'd never been to a Pentecostal church. And God drew her into the church. They were having service on a Sunday morning. She knew nothing about the Holy Spirit. Nothing. But God drew her into that place. And while she's in there, she feels the Holy Spirit. She's not not familiar with that. So they're singing songs and they're worshiping. She's she's moved by the Spirit of God that she's feeling in this place. She begins to worship with them. And while she's worshiping, and I'm telling you folks, if you're going through something, whatever your situation is, when you worship, things will happen in your life. Things will happen in this church when we worship. She knows nothing at all about the Holy Spirit. She's worshiping God. And all of a sudden, she starts speaking in tongues. Knew nothing at all about it. She's changed. She's touched. She's filled with the Holy Spirit right there. So it's possible for a person to receive, and this is an important, you've got to hear what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's possible for a person to receive the Holy Spirit and not understand what's just happened to them. Now remember, they answered, Paul said, we don't even, we've never heard that there is a Holy Spirit, we know nothing about it. So where it is possible for a person to receive the Holy Spirit and not know what it is, you cannot receive the Holy Spirit and not know that you did not receive it. You might know, you might receive the Holy Spirit and not understand what it is that you just received, but when you receive the Holy Spirit, you know. (laughs) You know that you received the Holy Spirit. Amber knew that she had something happen to her. She might not have understood what happened, what it was, but she knew, hey, there's something in this church. That ain't, that, ain't that the church down the road? So when a person receives the Holy Spirit, it's powerful. It's powerful. Woo! I, I'm telling you, I'm wound up this morning, folks. You can't preach like this and not get wound up, I'm telling you. It's refreshing. You'll never forget it. It's life changing. It's the Spirit of God bubbling up and out and through you. You will know exactly where you were when you received it. You will know what day you received it. So Amber goes into the church. She doesn't even, she never been in, in this church before in her life. God fills her with the Holy Ghost. She goes home and she starts telling her entire family. She starts tell, talking to her husband. She starts talking to her parents. She starts talking about her brothers or sisters. Do you know that whole family came into the church and God filled every single one of them with the Holy Ghost? Why? Because when you get the Holy Ghost, you can't keep it to yourself. You got, you're going around telling people, hey, I just got something. You got it. Have it. You need it. It's the, it's the best thing that I've ever had. I don't understand people that say, I don't feel like going to church when you've got the Holy Ghost. When you've got the Holy Ghost, how could you stay home? Well, I just had to be a pastor there for just a minute. Hope you forgive me. No, don't forgive me. Just hear me. God loves you. So above all things, Paul, 
was going around traveling on these missionary journeys. What was, what was he telling people? I'm telling you what he was telling people. He was telling people, you need to be saved. You need to, be, you need to repent of your sins. You need to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You need to be filled with the Spirit. And when he saw people that were already disciples, the first thing out of his mouth was not, hey, where, where do you go to church? Hey, where do you live? That was not what he asked. The first thing that he asked believers was, have you received the Holy Spirit since you you believe because it's the best gift that anybody could receive it's getting hot in here oh if you've never received the baptism of the holy spirit if you're here this morning or if you're listening to us on live stream and you've never received the baptism of the holy spirit can i tell you we just celebrated Good Friday, we took communion. We, we celebrated the resurrection Sunday. But can I tell you that whole purpose in Jesus dying and the whole purpose in Jesus being resurrected is so that every single person can receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He wants you. If you don't have it, if you don't have it and you're here this morning, you don't have to leave here without it because he died so you could have it. His resurrection is proof that it's available. He's alive and he's pouring out his spirit. The book of Acts is proof that it's being poured out. People are receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit around the world. Even today, this morning, God is still pouring it out. He wants you to receive it more than anything. But the question is, do you want it more than anything? Amen. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Based on what these believers said, Paul knew that they had not received the Holy Spirit, so he digs a little bit deeper. He says, and how were you baptized? Can I tell you, baptism is important. It, it's the whole gospel includes baptism. It, it includes repentance. Repentance is dying out to your sins. It's looking back on your life and you realize that you're not where you, you should be. You're doing some things, the things in your life that, that are not pleasing to God. You've got to repent it. You've got to turn your back on those things. Acts chapter 19, verses 3 through 5, he digs deeper. He says, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the, but the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who, who was to come after him. That is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Some believe and teach that baptism is not essential to salvation. However, the apostles taught baptism throughout the book of Acts. Paul explicitly asked, asked them about their baptism. He would not have done that if baptism was not important. He said, how were you baptized? They said, John baptism. He said, that's wonderful, but you're not baptized correctly. Can I tell you this morning, if you've been baptized and you don't absolutely, positively, 100% guaranteed, sure, that you've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, I'd be calling the church where I was baptized. I would say, hey, did you baptize? how did you baptize me? Did you baptize me in the name of Jesus Christ? Because I would want to be saved. I know when I went under the water, they said, I baptize you for the mission of sins in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right. And I came up out of that water changed. Yes. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So Paul explicitly asked them about baptism. Then he teaches them the truth. And they were disciples, so they were teachable. They heard it. The hungry followers of Jesus immediately obeyed and were baptized in the saving name of Jesus Christ. Yes. According to Scripture, some have received the Spirit before they get baptized, and that happens. Oh, yeah. However, when this does happen, when somebody does get the Holy Spirit before they're baptized, they're immediately commanded to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What does that tell you? It tells me that baptism is essential to salvation. Yeah. So baptism cleanses us from sin by applying, this is important, folks. Baptism cleanses us from sin by applying the blood of Jesus Christ to cover our sins. When the blood of Jesus Christ touches you and it happens in baptism, you are immediately made holy. Yes. Not by anything that you did, but by the blood of Jesus Christ. We put on Jesus Christ at baptism. We enter into a blood covenant with Jesus Christ through baptism. It gives us a fresh, clean start. It's as if you've never committed any sin. 
washed, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Peter wrote in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and to all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. If you've not been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches you that you must be baptized correctly. We read it right here in Acts chapter 19. You may have been, but I've seen, I've talked to people who have been baptized multiple times in multiple churches, in multiple ways. Some have been sprinkled when they're babies. Some have been baptized in titles of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is not the same as being baptized in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you've not been baptized correctly, I would encourage you to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Sister Renee, if you'd come, I'm wrapping this message up. Paul's message to all he met was very clear. In this case, he asked a simple question. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Their response was obedience to what Paul said they needed to do. Acts chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. My question this morning is the same as Paul's. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? Do you have it? If you say yes to that, you could go back. I could take you to the place. I could take you to the address to the church in Griffith, Indiana, where God filled me with the Holy Spirit. I could tell you who the preacher was. It was a night service. And when God fills you, you know beyond the shadow of a doubt. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? You can receive it exactly the way they did in Acts chapter 19. I'm going to do something here this morning because I feel like the Lord prompted me to do this. If you are here this morning and you have never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit or if you want to be refilled, I would like to ask you to stand right now. You say, oh, it's going to put me on the spot. Oh, yeah, it might. Look at this. Here's what we're going to do, folks. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to repent. We're going to ask God to forgive us. As you repent of your sins and you ask God to forgive you and he may reveal things to you that you're ashamed of, things that you've done, just call those things out. Say, God, I'm sorry that I've done such and such. I'm sorry. Lord, I'm not, I'm not going to do those things again. I'm turning my life away from sin. I want to serve you, God. I want you in my life. I turn my life over to you this morning, Lord, and that's repentance. We're going to do that, and then after we repent, and if you feel like crying, if your tears start welling up, because repentance is an emotional experience. If, you, if, if while you're praying and you feel tears roll, that's okay. You just go right ahead. You let those tears flow. And then after we do that, we're going to just start to worship him and thank him for forgiveness. We're going to thank him for the cross. We're going to thank him for his mercy. And then as you're worshiping, I just want you to just yield yourself to the Lord. And if words start coming out of your mouth that are not English, languages you've never learned before, I just want you to just keep on worshiping God and let the Holy Spirit fill you. So can we just repent right now together? Can we just ask God to forgive us? Lord, I'll go, oh, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for my failures. 
Lord God, I'm sorry for failing you. Lord, I'm sorry for the mistake. I'm sorry for the choices I've made. I'm sorry for doing things that have brought shame to you, Lord. Go ahead, speak it out. It's all right. None of us here are perfect. None of us here are without sin. Oh, Lord Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me for my failure. Forgive me for my sin. Oh, God, forgive me, Lord, for failing you. Lord, move. Reveal to us, oh, Lord God, our failings, our shortcomings. Lord, reveal to us, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry for failing you. I'm sorry, Lord God. Oh, I need you this morning. I need your mercy, Lord. I plead your mercy this morning, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Maybe you've been away from the Lord for a while. That's okay. The Lord's calling you back. Oh, he loves you this morning. Oh, you've been fighting battles. You've been fighting it. Oh, Lord God, forgive me. If you've walked away from him, tell him, Lord, I'm sorry for walking away from you. Lord, I'm sorry, Lord, for failing you. Oh, <laughs> he's moving here this morning. He's moving. That's it. When you feel, oh, why, right now, why don't you just begin to worship him and thank him for his mercy. Raise up those hands right now. Raise up those hands right now and just worship him. Thank him for his mercy. Thank him for his mercy.